Good afternoon. Yep, there you go. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Ira Winkler for his presentation, You Can Stop Stupid. Ira is a lead security principal for Trustwave and author of Advanced Persistent Security and the forthcoming book, You Can Stop Stupid. He's considered one of the world's most influential security professionals and was named the Awareness Crusader by CSO Magazine in receiving their CSO Compass Award. He has designed and implemented and supported security awareness programs at organizations of all sizes in all industries around the world. Ira began his career at the National Security Agency where he served in in various roles as an intelligence and computer systems analyst. He has since served in other positions supporting the cybersecurity programs in organizations of all sizes. I've been following Argura's presentations and writings throughout all of my uh, security career, so I mean it quite sincerely to say that it is my pleasure to introduce to you Ira Winkler. Thanks. Does this work? Can you can you hear? Okay. Wow, this is kind of weird where you're all hearing me and I'm not hearing me. So, interesting. Okay, so wow, I have a tr I so what happened was ye yesterday I sp I spoke at RSA. I gave a keynote. I gave the last keynote of the day and that was really annoying, but it's still a keynote so I shouldn't complain, but at the same time I had transcribers yesterday cuz they were doing closed captioning in real time. Now I have somebody doing sign language transcribing and I I just did it's like I don't know if it comes out the same in sign language. I know a few things but not a lot and it's like like for the trans the captioning people I said something like they're not sure of the reason that they're there but now they don't know what they know but they do know why they do not know what they know so anyway uh, and then I just was I kind of did every and then I asked the audience if they transcribers got it right because I thought that was kind of funny um, and see if they knew grammar but that's a side joke now so anyway yesterday I gave the presentation with Tracy Tracy was my co-presenter for this, and she's also my co-author, but I'm so much better. Even she would say that. Anyway, I have to say that because my ego won't let me not say that. So here's the concept for you can stop stupid. I always have stories on why I, t I give a presentation. So there was one time I was speaking at, a, it's a kind of an equivalent to a B-Sides, like corn con. That's what the Iowa version of B-Sides is. You know, lots of corn there. There, I guess. So anyway, what they were doing was I was on I was online before my talk on the buffet line, and there was a table, um, you know, along the buffet line, and they had a bunch of stickers. And oh, sorry, this I'm not, I'm not intent. Does anybody mind if I curse? Okay, so they were giving out, if, they, if you mind, just say it, I can come up with alternatives, it's just not as colorful. But anyway, so they were, they were giving out a bunch of stickers that said, don't click on shit. And so as I was walking along, the, the admin, there was like this at stereotypic admin type guy, and he looks over, sees this don't click on shit stickers on the table. He's like, I need a whole bunch of these. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I've got some of the stupidest users out there. I'm like, really? You must give your users a lot of shit to click on. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, they can't click on shit if they don't have shit to click on. And then he's like, and, and I go, and then if they're like, they're, they're clicking on it, what do you do to stop it after they click on it? He's like, what do you mean? I go, well, you're giving them all the shit to click on, and then they're clicking on it. I go, kind of your fault. He's like, what do you mean? I go, and, and anyway, he just, he knew what I meant. He just didn't want to admit it. So when you stop and think about it, here's the problem when we start talking about users. Everybody thinks it's the users. And frankly, you know, I'm going to get into this. I don't want to like cover too much of my presentation now, but we have a problem in this industry where we constantly blame the users in ways that nobody would ever think of blaming in other forms of business processes. So what we really need to do is start looking at the user as a part of the system. And that's a big difference compared to what people are currently doing, which is you're looking 
looking at this user and people are out there. I mean, you know, right now, awareness training is the new snake oil of cybersecurity because they're like, we want to create, you know, we are going to create the human firewall. We're going to create the last line of defense. And I'm like, if your users are the last line of defense, please quit now. Your users will fail miserably. I mean, consider how many, like how many people think that firewalls are the best thing to ever hit cybersecurity? And then stop and think, do you really want a human firewall? Those are even worse than the regular firewalls. So you got to start to consider that issue. Huh, let's see. Bing. So first, before we go on, what is stupid? You know, I actually looked it up in the dictionary and stupid by definition is having or showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense. Now, let's kind of try to break that down a little bit. You know, the definition of stupid is actually pretty simple. So even a stupid person knows what stupid is. So, you know, first place, do you hire people with a great lack of intelligence? You know, do you go out saying, I need to hire a stupid person. You know, and then you go ahead and then think about it this way. If you hire somebody who demonstrates a great lack of intelligence, whose fault is that? You know, I would say it's not the user's fault if they're that stupid. You're the one putting them in a position of responsibility. If they're this stupid, why did you hire them? I will, however, say, and uh, sorry, I'm not trying... I'm not trying to disparage anybody who ever worked at McDonald's, but McDonald's has a system in place where they can hire one of the dumbest people on the planet and they can still get consistently a hamburger. Like, I can get the same hamburger in downtown Tampa that I can get in Hungary. And literally, I did go to Hungary and get a ham McDonald's hamburger, except they called it a quarter, not a quarter pounder, but something different, like a Mick Royale, whatever they said in, in Pulp Fiction. But anyway, wow, Pulp Fiction reference. Didn't do one of those before. And uh, now let's talk about, do you hire people without common sense? You know, that's the other definition of stupid. Either they don't have intelligence or they don't have common sense. Now, in the first place, you know, my background's in psychology. That's my educational background. And, you know, there's a fundamental principle that says you can't have common sense without common knowledge. So if your people don't have common sense, that implies you're not giving them the common knowledge. So again, that falls back on you. Are you giving people the appropriate skills and, well, you can't give them abilities, but are you giving them the appropriate knowledge and skills that they need to do their job right? And if you're not giving them that skills, those ability uh, and that knowledge, that again comes back to your fault. So anyway, so now the question is, who's the stupid one? And I, I will refer to the great philosopher Peggy Bundy. And in one of the Peggy Bundy of every, how many people don't know Peggy Bundy? I hate you. But anyway, Peggy Bundy is a character out of the show Married with Children. And it's one of those things where like, you know, how many people know, for those of you who don't know Peggy Bundy, how many people know Modern Family? Okay. So anyway, in Modern Family, the guy, the, the old guy who has Sofia Vergara as the husband, that is Al Bundy. Sofia Vergara is essentially Peggy Bundy, but a little bit lower class, trashy type. So anyway, so just imagine Peggy Bundy once had one of the mo best lines ever on TV. And that philosophy was, if you give a monkey a gun and the monkey shoots somebody, do you blame the monkey or the person who gave the monkey the gun? This is pretty much what we're doing in cybersecurity. We're out here, and I'm not even saying the users are monkeys, but we're basically acting like we're giving the monkey a gun, and it's not their, and it's not, it's not your fault. So anyway, keep that in mind. So here's the other part of this. Does anybody here do awareness for a living? Okay, so I can really go ahead off on this one then. So, you know, for the most part, you know, it's not your fault either. It's not your fault as computer, computer professionals or IT professionals or whatever you want to call yourselves because you've been fed a bunch of crap over the years. You've been fed this whole thing like you can create the paragons of virtue. You can create the human firewall. You can create, you know, the, the last line of defense, the first line of defense and all that. 
You know, it's like bro science. If like you work out a lot, you see all those like, uh, you know, like the, what is it? The lunk heads in the gym, like protein, bro, you know, lots of protein. You know, it's like we have the same thing for awareness. It's like funny videos. We need funny videos. We need gamification. Nobody knows who says gamification, that gamific, what actually is gamification, but they love it, even though they have no clue what it is. So anyway, this is the problem. You are being fed a bunch of crap by the people in the awareness industry because they want to sell you stuff. I would love somebody in the awareness industry because I'm, I'm technically in it. Let me tell you something. Awareness 100% will fail at some point in time. I promise you that. And any security professional who sells you or offers you something who never, who says, who, that their stuff isn't going to fail, they are a fool or a liar or both. So everything will fail at one point in time. So just like awareness will fail, but everybody in the awareness industry is, you know, we will conquer human error. You're not conquering human error. I promise that. Anybody who believes that human error is conquered, they kind of like really reinforce the fact because they convinced you of something really dumb. So anyway, I'll leave it there. So here's the thing. Again, not really you, but the other part of this is everybody's focusing on the proximity of the error. In other words, they're sitting there saying, well, the user clicks on a phishing message. The user is therefore what we need to fix. The user is the proximity of the error. And I'm going to beat this to death a little bit later. But for example, if there's an error, like if there's a medical issue where like, for example, somebody performs surgery, they're like, it's the fault of the surgeon. If there's a plane crash, it's the fault of the pilot. If there's something or other, car crash, it's the fault of the driver. The reality is when we start looking into this, you're going to see these people are, f well, I shouldn't say that. You got some really bad doctors out there. But, you know, these people are just the proximity. It doesn't mean they're the cause of the error. And that's a very, very big distinction that people don't want to acknowledge. So generally, what we're doing is, you know, it's like, if a user makes a mistake, everybody says, we need more awareness training. We need better awareness training. We need funnier awareness training. That's like saying we need healthier canaries if canaries die in a coal mine. That is not what really should happen. What you need to do is figure out if there is an error, why did the error happen? Much like if a canary dies in a coal mine, the, coal, the canary died not because the canary wasn't healthy. The canary died because the mine wasn't safe. If a user makes a mistake, that's because the system is essentially not safe in one form or another. So let's take a look. Anybody know who? Anybody not know who this is? I hate you even more. Anyway, so <laughs> this is Newman from the TV show Seinfeld. I have a Brazilian girlfriend. I explain all of American culture with Seinfeld. I don't intend it that way, but I just sit there and watch Seinfeld, and all of a sudden, it's like, wait, let me tell you, I'm like trying to explain something, and all of a sudden, I come up with a Seinfeld reference. But either way, this is Newman, and Newman is the sorry, I'm from New York, the putz, the loser, the idiot. He And somehow he ended up one day doing accounting for these people. Now, he has nothing to do with what I'm going to present, but I needed a good slide for accounting. So what happens with accounting, how many of you travel for work? Okay, a few people. How many of you ever have to take out money or, or fill out expense reports, fill out time cards for work? You fill this out. What happens if you don't fill out your time card properly? Does somebody say, oh, we can't blame these people? No, we can't do that. You know, we go ahead. No, you don't get paid if you don't fill out your time card properly. You don't get reimbursed if you don't fill out your travel vouchers properly. Does anybody say... We need awareness training to tell people what to be afraid of, how they should not fill out their travel vouchers right. They basically say, your job is to do your travel voucher in the prescribed way. If you don't do it in the prescribed way, it will get rejected, period. That's the start of it. That's the last of it. 
But then think of it also this way. How many people think that if a CFO walked into a meeting and said, you know what? We had a million dollar loss yesterday and we had a million dollar loss because, you know, it's people. We can't control those people. You know, people do things. We can't blame the users because they're just users. It would be unfair. No, that CFO would be fired immediately if there was any sort of financial loss because he he did not anticipate a user doing something in a non-prescribed way. Because in accounting, as an example, they set out processes from start to finish. They say what's going to be recorded, how it's going to be recorded, how it's going to be categorized. They tell people how to input the data. Then they have a whole bunch of audit features that after the fact start auditing and seeing, did everything happen a way it should have happened and so on. And so that way is kind of like interesting. From start to finish, there's a process that anticipates error along the way and mitigates the error along the way. And that's critical. So now, another thing people don't know about me is, well, I don't know, some people might, but I'm, I'm a master scuba diver trainer. I love diving, and then I want to dive more frequently, so I said, how can it be tax deductible? So I said, well, if I'm a, di master, a diver instructor, I have to keep diving to keep my skills refreshed. So anyway, I, I, I'm now a scuba instructor. So I, the first time I ever heard the phrase, you can't stop stupid, can't, C-A-N-T, stop stupid was when I was going through dive instructor training and the instructor well, I guess he's technically the instructor instructor he was sitting there saying well you can't stop stupid and I sat there and st started thinking about it. I'm like this whole class is about stopping stupid because when you look at the whole dive anybody here dive you know certified divers Okay, a few people. You can confirm with the others. And no, I don't hate you if you're not a diver. It's your loss in this case. But anyway, so... If you've ever do, if you've ever gone through scuba instruction, the first thing you do is you fill out a medical form. They make sure you're relatively healthy. Then if you're relatively healthy, they put you in a pool and make you swim like a hundred yards or whatever it is to make sure you're not going to freak out in the water. Do they really care how well you swim? No. They real, that's just to make sure that when you go in the water, you're not going to be acting like you're in a panic. <clears throat> People still do, but at least they know it's not going to be from the very beginning. Then they sit you through a whole bunch of classes. Most of these classes are pretty much to try to tell you how not to kill yourself. Because think of it this way. In scuba diving, there is an infinite number of ways you can die. Frankly, go out on the street, drive a car. There's an infinite number of ways you can die. But either way, in scuba diving, you go through, uh, you know, you have to read dozens of hours of training, take tests and everything, and then they finally put you in a pool. They put you in a pool, and what is that? Maybe 10 feet of water where you go through basic skills. Again, trying to make sure that you're relatively comfortable, have these skills down before they put you in a more dangerous situation. Then assuming you pass this, you go to an open water you know facility the open water facility isn't really very open water it's not allowed to be more than 30 feet deep usually it's probably around 15 to 20 feet deep and it's kind of hard to kill yourself in 15 to 20 feet in water but people can but they don't but then you start and see and this is actually a picture where they're testing people and um, you know without going through the details they're trying to like see if people can just kind of get neutral buoyancy and these people around now another part Part is before we take students in the water at the facility in the first place I have to make sure my insurance is up to date. The school I would teach under has to make sure their insurance is up to date. The dive facility we go to has to make sure their insurance is up to date. And then the students don't know it, but we take out a uh, policy for the students they don't know about. So if they kill themselves, they're covered by that policy. We don't want them to know because then they'll try to make up some reason to sue. But then what happens is they get in there. We're covered. We also go ahead. We know where the hyperbaric chamber are just in case something goes wrong. We have medical equipment, we have oxygen equipment, and this is all before we get in the water. Then we inspect their equipment, we have the students inspect their equipment. We don't trust these students because they've just not learning about it, but we still go through and do all that. Then we put them in the water, and then you can barely see this, but in the far, sorry I'm bad at this, far upper right hand corner, you see one guy 
hovering there. And that's an assistant instructor or a dive master that a good instructor would bring along with them because it's hard to keep track while you're trying to make sure each individual student is doing something that other students don't go off and do something stupid. I was once certifying people and I was down there and all of a sudden in the corner of my eye, I was working with somebody like right there and I see this one guy start looking over the edge of the platform and start to crawl underneath. And I'm like, I'm thinking, what is this idiot doing? You know, I told him, don't go off this platform before. But then luckily, the assistant instructor pulled him up and put him back on the platform and said, stay here or whatever it was. But then all that is in place. And it statistically makes scuba diving safer than bowling. Because people have heart attacks when they bowl because they're in that good physical condition. They need better medicals. So... Another corresponding thing, you know, a lot of scuba instruction, much like accounting, it's kind of along the lines of safety science. And for those of you who want more information, there's, um, forgot his last name, but this guy Decker, D-E-K-K-E-R, is really good on safety science type of stuff. And what they look at is that a user, the current safety science is that a user is just part of the system. If the user fails, that is a failure in the entire system. If if somebody is injured at work, that person is injured at work because the whole system has led to the point where that person has injured themselves. And that's a very, very critical distinction. You know, so for example, I was once, um, I was doing a secure, I was creating an awareness program for this company that does lighting and manufacture lighting. And we were talking to the safety guy because we like, when we implement a quit, um, awareness programs, we like to learn from other programs that awareness is part of it as well. So we spoke to the safety guy, and the safety guy said, yeah, you know, on our factory floors... You know, we drew these yellow lines down, the, like kind of like a third of the way over down the aisles. And he's like, because what we found was we had a lot of accidents where forklifts were driving into people or people were walking into forklifts. So we, you know, we came up with all these studies and finally I invested in 50 gallons of paint and I painted a line down the aisles and people were to stay to the right and forklifts were to stay to the left. And all our accidents went away, except for maybe about 10% of them. And then that was because people were on their iPhones and wandering over into there, or the drivers were just looking in the wrong places and still hit people. But this is critical. And a big thing about safety science, safety science people generally have millions and millions of dollars at their disposal because if somebody injures themselves in a company, there are hard financial costs for this. In the cybersecurity world, we don't track that as well. But if somebody injures themselves on the job, there's insurance, there's investigations, there's potentially a workers' comp, they might sue you or something like that. So there's a lot of hard data science and they review everything. But again, the proximity of where the accident or injury occurs is just the symptom. The users are the symptoms. They're not the cause. They're just what the symptoms are of the problem. So now these are a bunch of Boeing 737 MAX jets, and I'm assuming a lot of you have heard about that, even though you, for some reason, don't know who Peggy Bundy is. So these 737 MAX jets... Obviously, there were two deadly accidents with them and a bunch of other, you know, incidents where they didn't crash. And now everybody was saying, was this pilot error? When these first happened, everybody was like, this is pilot error. The pilots stared the planes into the ground. And then once they started looking at it, well, actually start thinking about it. You know, could the pilots have saved the planes? Yes, they could have. However, wait, you know, was it possible? Yeah, it was remotely possible they could have saved the planes. But what really happened was, yes, the pilots were at the control, and if they knew how to shut down the autopilots, 
And maybe they could save it. But the problem was, the pilots were, first off, they pretty much were told, you don't really need much training on these new planes, because these are 737 MAX jets, they're kind of the same as the 737 800 737-900s that you all have previously flown, so you don't really need much. You know, but they didn't tell them, well, by the way, we've kind of changed a few things. The whole balance of the plane's different, because the engines are a little bit different different, and the whole weight of the planes are different, so they fly a little different, but it's, you don't worry about that. And then another thing they did was there's these things called um, AOAs, angle of attack sensors, on the front of the airplanes, and there's two, one on each side. And in the old, well, the old, the other 737 planes, if one was off and the other one, if one was off, like one said we're going down, the other said you're going up, there was a warning that said there's a discrepancy between the two. They took that away. That was an optional safety feature that um, airlines had to pay extra for. And they, you know, some of them chose not to pay extra for that. There's also a whole bunch of different functions where before, if there was a discrepancy, not only would it say there's a discrepancy, but it kind of let the pilots decide. In this case, however, they basically said, you know what? If one says you're going down, we're just going to assume the plane's going down. Or sorry, no, the plane's going up. So we're going to steer the plane down. So when the pilots were able to save the plane in one case, they went ahead, they're like, wow, we got it back under control. They put the autopilot back on. Autopilot says, hey, we're going to steer you right back into the ground. And that's why one of the accidents happened. But these were systematic problems that occurred, not just by the proximity, but they happened when they started writing software years before these accidents. So there was a whole systematic failure along the way. So now going back into safety science, when people actually look at where incidents happen, why did these incidents happen, who's really at fault, when they've gone through this, they found that 90% of all injuries or incidents, however you want to call them, are the result of the environment. Only 10% are the result of a user doing something you might want to consider stupid in theory. But these 10%, like what are they? So for example, in factories, you know, people might drop a like a heavy wrench and break their foot as one example they might drive a forklift into somebody you know and why are they doing this it's like well you know without a line down the center it sounds stupid but there's chaos for lack of a better term you know it's kind of like one of those um, it's like an airport you know how like they have those guys come out with lights and tell the trucks to stop to let the plane go by it's a lot like that you know, in factory floors without, you know, not having the people with those like little lights that say stop. So these people look at it and say, hey, wait a second. These people are being injured, not because of their own actions, but 90% of the time, if we manipulate the environments, we'll get rid of these injuries. And that's critical. The other 10% are the user's fault. So what are, what is that 10%? And that 10% includes, you know, things like what you might call stupid, carelessness. Some might be blatant ignorance where the users just don't know. Some might be a lack of training. And again, that lack of training might be on you. You know, we all see like, you know, around, we all see like, how many people watch like Fail Army on the internet or like the Darwin Awards and stuff like that? There are always somebody like you see trying to clear a stuck snowblower, like where you're like, oh, I'm in Florida. Why am I giving this example? But you know, there are these these things called snow blowers where you push it away and it blows the snow to the side and it has these cranks that you know, eat up the snow. And what happens is, like, every so often it gets stuck, and then you see this thing cranking away, and it gets stuck, and then you see somebody trying to push the snow into it. That's stupid. I give you that. That, you can call that person stupid. But, you know, you have issues like that. But a lot of people also forget the possibility of malice. Sometimes when you have this, somebody might actually want to cause damage to the organization. They might just be a psychopath or a sociopath. They just want it. They don't care. They might just think it's interesting, you know, like um, in the Batman movie. Some people just want to watch things burn, and that's why they do these things. So anyway, that's the 10% of the problem. Now, here's the other part, because everybody says, we need better awareness. Awareness is only 20% of that 10%. Applied behavioral science, in essence, is that 
um, antecedent creates a behavior. Or I shouldn't say creates, influences a behavior. That's a very big distinction. Because you give somebody information, maybe, maybe not, they'll follow that information. You know, but again, it's called, it's called an antecedent because information, like it's, you know, you don't want to call it IBC because IBC sounds like a, a disease. So ABC sounds much cooler. So anyway, it's an antecedent influences a behavior. Then a behavior does actually create a, co a consequence. Consequences drive 80% or more of user behaviors in the future. So for example, example, I'm sitting at a restaurant and, uh, you know, a waitress comes over and says, oh, this plate is hot. I'm going to be sitting there like, I'm a man. Give me that plate. And I'm going to grab that plate. I'm going to singe my fingers, trying to act like I'm not in serious pain. I'm going to put the plate down, pry my fingers away from my skin at that point. And then the next time the wait waitress comes over with a plate of ice cream, I'm going to be like, oh, please put that down. Down. Why? I suffered a consequence that was undesirable. The other part in cybersecurity that's critical, though, that we have to understand is sometimes the consequences for bad things are good for the user. So, for example, a very common one in our field is we tell users not to reuse your business password with your person as your personal password. What is the consequence for that? Absolutely nothing. Actually, it's a positive consequence. And the reason it's a positive consequence is the user doesn't have to remember another password. You don't know it's a reused password. You can actually figure that out if you have like, you know, threat intelligence tools that search the dark web, dark web and look for compromised passwords. And sometimes you can test those passwords, but that takes a little bit of work. But usually, bad user actions have a positive consequence for them, so it's reinforced. But anyway, even awareness and the ideal circumstance is only going to influence 20% of the 10% of behaviors. And the awareness profession doesn't want to tell you that. So... What type of action actually, you know, what, what we're trying to do is create a strategy for dealing with user, and I'll call this user initiated loss. Because just because a user takes an action, it doesn't mean it has to create damage. It doesn't mean it has to create a loss. And this is a key distinction. The user is only initiating a sequence of actions. It does not mean the user's creating a loss. You are allowing the, the loss to be created because you have to anticipate that a user is going to do something negative and you're allowing that user to create the a damage and this is going to be a critical distinction as we move forward now boom and I'm going to just move on but you can see what you know pretty pick well ugly kind of picture I couldn't find a good one anyway so what is boom boom is a counterterrorism strategy boom is essentially where terrorists you know an explosion is a boom and what happens is left a boom is what can you theoretically do proactively to stop an attack from happening? That's number one. That's left a boom. Right a boom is what can you do after the attack to mitigate the potential damage and begin recovery? So using the, like using, um, boom as a strategy, let me give like, for example, uh, so there's, there's no happy examples. I'll be upfront with you about this. But anyway, let's use like September 11th attacks as one of the examples. So, and let's use the Pentagon as, I'll use the Pentagon specifically and you'll see why in a second. But, you know, you look at this and you say, well, gee, why were, you know, we, were we tracking terrorists? It's like, yeah, we were kind of tracking terrorists and the job of the government is to to theoretically figure out who the terrorists are, what are their operations, figure out how to stop the terrorists from either existing or forwarding their acts. Then simultaneously, you also want to go ahead and strengthen your protection. And the reason I use the Pentagon as an example is a lot of people don't realize this, but 
a couple years before the September 11th attack, they actually did strengthen the Pentagon for potential, not necessarily an airplane, but they strengthened like fire protection. They put some extra steel in there that stopped a whole bunch of damage. So even though a plane flew in and there was significant damage, it was not as bad as it would have been if it happened a couple years earlier because they hardened those buildings proactively, again, not knowing what it was. And that's a critical factor. You don't have to know what the attacks are to harden the surface. But anyway, then boom happened. And now moving on to uh, another unpleasant example. You know, so when, when there's a bombing, yes, you want to figure out, can we stop these people imminently right before the bombing? That's kind of what you want to do during boom. But let's start moving after boom. After boom, first thing you have to do is be afraid of something like a secondary attack, as an example. So in the Boston Marathon bombing, they had the first bombing, and then there was a delay, like, you know, a couple minutes delay, I can't remember the exact amount, but before the second bombing. So what happened was first people ran away, then all the first responders came in, and they were the potential victims of the secondary explosion that happened. Likewise, you have to have your, you know, you have to prepare, what about if there's like, chemical poisonous gas. And this might or might not be intentional. So for example, if a bomb accidentally like hits a propane leak or something like that, you have to be prepared for that. Likewise, you have to make sure proactively, and this actually came up during a congressional hearing this week, Sorry, is it this week or last week? Well, we're Saturday. Anyway, the week before today. Um, what happened was during a congressional hearing, one of the senators asked the head of or one of the DHS people, do we have enough respirators for people who might get their, um, what is it called, the coronavirus? Uh, COVID-19. Yeah, COVID-19, that's easier. Oh, put your sign down. Anyway, um, but COVID-19, you know, but, you know, do we have that? So anyway... That's another factor. Are we prepared? And that's a whole science, and it's different disciplines along the way. And each phase is essentially its own security process. You know, each phase involves protection, detection, and reaction. You know, and the canary, the canary, like canary dying in a coal mine, is only involved at the point of boom. 97, now, let's take a step back. If you read the Verizon data breach report, the Verizon data breach report, and pretty much every other report says, 90% of all significant losses result from some form of a user-initiated chain of events. I'm phrasing it as user-initiated chain of events in this case. So each phase that you're going to do has protect, detect, and react. And as I mentioned before, I put a slide here specifically on that. I'm dealing with a concept, and I want you to think user-initiated loss. I don't want you to think stupid user. Much like that guy who was wanting to give out stickers that said, you know, don't click on shit. You have to first realize that you are giving people shit to click on. That's number one. But if they just cause they click on shit, it doesn't mean it ruins your network. If somebody clicking on shit ruins your network, your network sucks. You got to understand that. So anyway, the user just initiates possible loss. You have to actually give the user the ability to create the loss. You have to facilitate the loss and so on. So let's step through the whole process of left a boom, boom, and right a boom from a cybersecurity perspective. So in the first place, what are you going to do to prevent the user from being put in the position of initiating the loss? That's number one. What are you going to do to stop your user from, appeared, from appearing to be stupid? You know, ideally, maybe you want to take away the decision capability. You know, you have a user who has some capability, like too much file privileges or something. Maybe you shouldn't give them that privilege. Maybe you shouldn't like go ahead and define like you can do this or that or something else. You want to create a culture of consequences to assist things. So, you know, I mentioned, for example, that, um, what was a good one? Uh, so I, w I worked at NSA. 
working at NSA, we, we always had to wear our badge. And if like you didn't wear your badge, you got a bunch of hell for that. Not from your bosses or anything, but from your coworkers. So there's one time I was working shift work, really hated the job, but I was working overnight and we were tracking certain types of military units. I can't tell you what or how, but every time we saw one of these units, I'd have to like get a map out and plot and the plotter would put where the unit was on the map. And they had a moving arm and what I had to do was I had to take off my bed so it didn't get wrapped up. So anyway, one day I put the map out, put out a report, and then I ran to the restroom. And then as I was coming back, there's a guard. The guard's like, where's your badge? And I'm like, what? Right. I go, it must be at my desk. He's like, we're going to your desk. I go, you're not allowed anywhere near my desk. He's like, I'll wait by the door. So anyway, I go in the room and I'm looking around there and I'm like looking under the desk. I can't find it. And then all of a sudden my coworker is sitting there. He's like, are you looking for something, Ira? I'm like, where's my damn badge? Uh, actually, I said fucking. I already got permission to curse. I'm like, where's my fucking badge? And the guy's like, what badge? The one that should be around your neck? I'm like, give me my fucking badge. And I start, and then the guard's like, is there a problem? hair and then all of a sudden then I finally got my badge and then do you think I ever forgot that badge again no I mean there was another case where I went to a government contractor I left my burn bag out I didn't even know I didn't even know like one morning I get to work I get a call Ira can you come to my office it was the security manager the security manager are you missing anything I go not that I know of he's like how about this does this look familiar I'm like, I don't have a personal relationship with it. It was my burn bag, though. He's like, well, we got this from your desk. So I go, okay, never forgot my burn bag again. But there was a culture of sending guards around to make sure these things didn't happen. So anyway, number one, left a boom. Governance, and here's the key factor. Do you define how a process should be committed from start to finish? Can you take your users out of the decision-making process so that they're not even in the position to create the loss and so on. He's giving me dirty looks because I'm running out of time. Blame him. Anyway, so boom, this is where the user is presented with the opportunity to initiate loss or not initiate loss. Do they detect the loss? Do they stop the loss? Do they go ahead and do the bad action or what? put that down? Anyway, and then do they go ahead and sound the alarms? But again, this could be accidental or it could be malicious. And you have to, you don't, and let me tell you one thing. You don't care if the user is doing something bad because they're malicious or because they're just well-meaning or because they made a mistake. You just care that the user is potentially initiating a loss. Much like accountants, they don't know initially why they're investigating. They just detect that a loss is in there. Now, here's the thing about policies and governance and where I have a problem with most awareness training. Most awareness training, and how many people don't know Elmer Fudd? Okay, good. We're, we fe oh, no, she raised her hand. Anyway, sorry, you'll have to ask a friend on this one. Blame him because he's not giving me time. But anyway, so most awareness programs are teaching people how to be on the lookout for the wascally wabbit. They're trying to tell people what to be afraid of. They're saying, be afraid of the hacker. They're going to send you phishing messages. As opposed to telling you, here's how you do your job right. And how you do your job right, how it's defined, should go ahead and proactively address potential ways bad people might try to manipulate you. And this sounds like a very fine line, but this is a very critical line because you want to define to people how to do their jobs right, much like how you fill out your time card. They don't tell you, oh, make sure you don't do this or don't do that. They tell you, here's how you fill out your time card right, and if you don't get it right, you're not getting paid. And then you learn how to do it right pretty quickly. Then... Right, a boom. A loss has been initiated. Does the environment anticipate it in one way or another at some macro level or a fine micro level for that specific attack? The right, a boom, your environment has to expect that users are going to initiate a loss. How are you going to proactively plan for the initiation of a loss and maybe let some of it go? Maybe you let all of it go and you suffer a loss, but at least go ahead and understand how the loss occurs because it's not cost effective to stop everything and that's a critical factor how many people are security people in this room 
Okay, you're all failures. By definition, you are failures. I looked up the definitions. I, I read the dictionary. But so the definition of security is being free from risk. You will never be free from risk. Your job is how to optimize your risk, how to balance potential spending on secure, so, well, risk management, how to balance potential spending on preventing potential loss with allowing the potential loss to go on because you do not have the resources and budget to do everything. So keep that in mind. Most important, you proactively go back, figure out why the loss occurred, figure out how it could be prevented in the future, figure out how you got lucky because frequently it could have been much worse, figure out why you got really unlucky sometimes and go ahead and proactively look at that so it doesn't happen again. Now that all sounds difficult, but they do that in safety science, they do that in accounting, they do that in medical fields, and the human body's kind of complicated. Keep that in mind. They do this in operations. If there's a major factory outage, they go back and figure out how did this outage happen, how can we prevent it in the future, and so on. Now consider this. If you can prevent 90% of the incidents, again, the incidents involving where a user initiates the loss, you're going to go ahead and mitigate a lot of other problems, a lot of the other 10%. And let me walk through this quickly. And yeah, I'm almost done. Don't put up any more signs, honestly. But um, so the CEO, look at W2 fraud. Right now, we are going to have rampant W2 fraud around the country. W2 fraud, for those, if you don't know Elmer Fudd, I shouldn't expect you to know W2. Those are the tax forms you get at the year. Companies have to send out tax forms, and they usually send it to an accounting firm for the accounting firm to review it and send it out. So what happens is it's very common for criminals to try to send a phishing message in and say, I'm the CEO to a low-level HR person and say, I'm the CEO. We have a new accounting firm. We need you to forward all the W-2 information to this accounting firm. And clearly, it's a criminal act. But, you know, it's a criminal firm, but they want to go ahead and steal tax refunds. But anyway, it goes out and everybody's like, okay, um, wow, we got tricked. Here's what should happen. In the first place, you should have anti-phishing. You should have anti-malware in place to go ahead and filter out most of the, if not all of these emails. Ideally, you tag external emails to ensure that it's, an, you know, that's like the CEO's coming from the external. Why is that? And give the users all these hints. Then simultaneously, once it gets to the, yeah, I know. And once it gets to the user, all of a sudden, you have done your job. Um, anyway, once it gets to the user, we're sitting there, and the user shouldn't be thinking, is this the wascally wabbit? The user should be thinking, this is a request for PII. Requests for PII have to go through the head of HR, as well as get approval from the general counsel. It's not my job to figure out if this is the wascally wabbit or not. I am going to go ahead and send this to the head of HR, say, here's a request I received. Then let's say for some reason the user doesn't follow that instruction, or let's say the head of HR falls for this. Then what you do is you go ahead and you have data leak prevention software you know, along the way, and data leak prevention software will prevent this from going out proactively. Likewise, you can say, hey, you're attaching a sensitive file. Do you really want to do that and potentially get fired? That would help the situation along. But now, that's how it should be done properly. Consider the overlap, though. This is handling a PII. The fact it's W-2, think about it this way. This can handle PII, or sorry, this can handle W-2 fraud, the same way it can handle like um, HIPAA fraud, the same way it can handle any other types of fraud that's related to PII. Data leak prevention stops a lot of other attacks and so on. Filters on incoming messages stop other phishing messages and so on. This I beat to death. I'm not going to do that. Um, that I beat to death too. Here's a critical point, though, awareness is still mandatory. I know I beat up on awareness, but awareness should be there to tell people how to do things right. Awareness isn't perfect. I give you that. But the issue is it's still a critical part of a good security program if implemented properly. That's the most important part. It should be implemented how it should be implemented. Now, here's a critical concept. Are you basically addressing your user problem with a tactic, or do you, are you implementing with a strategy? The problem is people are addressing user error with the tactic of awareness. It's kind of like saying, for example, I, want, I have a war to fight. I want my tanks to go in and, and, and like go in and do everything. 
tanks are a tactic. You can't go ahead and, and win a war with just tanks. You need the air support. You need the cyber support these days. You go ahead, you need infantry because you can't just blow up a village. You need to occupy the village and so on. Likewise, for handling user error, you need a strategy from start to finish that includes, you know, left a boom, boom, and right a boom, and includes awareness and everything else. But the message you should take, Again, you're not trying to put healthier canaries out there. You're trying to make sure the mines are safe. That is the most critical thing you can get out of this presentation. I'm going to skip this apply because it's just specific to RSA. But either way, buy my book. It's awesome. And then actually, this is a new thing. So I need your, I need a vote here very quickly because he gave me, he's giving me dirty looks. Number one, do you like the one on the right? Uh, sorry, the, the one with the stop sign. Okay. So first, the one on the, oh, what's that? The left. How many people like the one on the left? Okay. How many people like the one on the right? It writes about two thirds consistently, you know, the stop sign. Okay, thank you very much for that. Here's my contact. Have a lovely day. And I'm not that much over.